previously in the complete creation. Maglio, Brock and Isaac keep using that word independent when referring to their dating methods. In the words of Inigo Montoya, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Welcome back. You have been very tenaciously following through in this exhaustive series, and congratulations for making it thus far, especially after the last lecture, which was incredibly confusing to follow. But that wasn't my fault. Don't shoot the reporter. This lecture is going to be just as confusing as the last one, and for the same reasons. We were walking the trail with copious numbers of circular branch trails that all led to the same place with regards to radiometric dating of a layer of volcanic ash in Africa dubbed the KBS Tuff. It had been tested using multiple methods available in the toolbox of the Deep Time Advocates and all of the hundreds of samples. Almost a dozen different researchers at this point and four different dating methods all pointed to an age for that ash of about 2.6 million years old. In the middle of all this testing, Skull 1470, a fossil human skull, was discovered immediately below that ash layer. The dates previously assigned to the KBS Tuff meant that that skull was now the oldest fossil human to have ever been found. The discoverer of the skull, Team Richard Leakey, wanted badly to retain that title for the skull, but a problem was fomenting in the background. The skull was far too modern to be that age according to the evolution model, which demands that man physically change, evolve, over time. According to that evolutionary timeline, the modern features of the skull should place it way up here on the timeline, not back here, which is where all, of the, different all the different dating methods were placing it. In all of this, we wound up in a rather unique situation. The rocks were dated first in anticipation that the site would lead to important discoveries. And then years later, Skull 1470 was found. I bring all of this up as we analyze the different dating methods used to argue for deep time and an age of the earth millions of times greater than the 6,000 year age the Bible gives us. The most ardent advocates of deep time will often call upon alleged examples of multiple radio dating methods all agreeing on the same age for one rock to build up a compelling sounding narrative showing the radio dating methods work. But now those same deep time advocates have painted themselves into a corner and initiated a battle royale. Something has to lose in this conflict. Either the age of the fossil and all of the work all of those scientists over years using hundreds of samples and multiple dating methods, or the evolutionary column. We just witnessed how all of these dating methods wind up in such strong agreements, and we witnessed it all by reading the peer-reviewed scientific literature. They literally removed dates that did not agree and assumed they were anomalous. So of course all the dating methods agreed. The biggest difference in this case study is that they openly acknowledged when they did this and justified their decisions in print. But now this battle royale has started and something has to give. I wonder what will give and on what grounds will they justify the winner. 
I closed off the last lecture with a quote from the scientists in 1976 who kicked off this whole dating the KBS tough thing, started in 1969. In 1975, Curtis et al., again in the peer-reviewed nature, peer-reviewed journal Nature, built some potassium argon isochrons using most of some 20 samples from various locations of the KBS tough. Now you remember how isochrons work. Isochrons are supposed to be the holy grail of radio dating, where you take multiple samples, chart them using their parent-daughter isotope ratios, and then if they make a line in the chart, that line can be used to calculate the age of the rock in question. The alleged power of the isochron method is that you don't need to know the starting conditions of the clock in the rock. Their isochrons returned ages of 1.6 and 1.82 million years. A pretty far cry from the rock solid age of 2.61 million years previously determined from hundreds of samples by multiple researchers using multiple dating methods. If you count them, you'll notice that there are several sample, samples that were left off of the isochron. Hmm. One has to wonder why they did that, but you already know the answer, which we are going to read straight from the horse's mouth in just a moment. After going over the extensive history of dating the KBS Tough over the past five years, Curtis and team said the quiet part out loud. <laughs> The original age determinations had a broad scatter of dates, both older and younger. Why? Because of contamination and overprinting. So, before we proceed, let's just get the record straight. These guys are saying that the 10 or so researchers who studied the KBS stuff and analyzed hundreds of samples and data points all agreed on the wrong date because of contamination and overprinting. So these guys just tossed out years of research published in peer-reviewed journals, and if you look at Curtis et al's paper, they reveal that they too rejected some of their own dates. That's why they didn't include several of the samples in the isochrons. Look at the spread of ages they got, different by a factor of four and a half times. But hey, What's good for the goose is good for the gander, right? Notice how everybody is literally picking and choosing which dates they keep and which ones they throw away. Now, of course, they justify their choices, but what if the situation was different? In fact, what dates would they choose if the only difference in this entire scenario was that Skull 1470 was found at another place or never found at all? Would all of the researchers choose the same dates? I would contend the answer is an emphatic no. They would never even get to the point of questioning the 2.61 million year age. After all, that date was confirmed over and over and over again. But the claimed 2.9 million year age for the very not ancient looking skull, 1470, forced everyone to go looking for a different date. The situation was unacceptable to evolutionary theory. Notice the contention was not scientific, but philosophical in nature. And so, in 1975, Curtis et al. fired the first shots against the fortress built on that 2.61 million year age for the KBS Tough. So in the year following the Curtis et al. paper, Fitch and Miller teamed up with Hooker to pen that paper from which I cited in, the, in closing out the last lecture, effectively responding to the claims and critique of Curtis et al. Fitch et al. start off the paper by saying, uh, hey, you guys remember our original research showed anomalous dates we rejected? We rejected those dates because the samples were obviously contaminated with older rock. So we focused on getting rocks which we know are young. You'll remember their 
first batch of radio dating tests returned ages in the hundreds of millions of years, and they absolutely threw out all of those absolute ages because clearly the rocks were contaminated. So Fitch and Miller and Hooker bring a bunch more rocks to the table that they carefully selected, rocks they know are young and not contaminated. One will be forgiven for asking questions like, how do they know the original rocks were contaminated? And why didn't you carefully select uncontaminated rocks in the first place? Okay, time to place your bets. According to Fitch, Miller, and Hooker, we know these fresh rocks are very young because A. They look like they are young. B. They smell like they are young. C. They taste like they are young. And don't be too quick to rule out this option, as anybody who knows geologists, one of the first things they do in identifying a rock is to lick it. D. They feel like they are young. Or E. They sound like they are young. Let's go to their paper for the answer to this million-year-old question. They carefully selected their samples by hand-picking only the most obviously juvenile crystals from sawn slabs of pumice beneath a binocular microscope. One will be forgiven for asking how on earth you can tell if a rock is young or old by looking at it under a binocular microscope. Now, before you get too excited because you think you won the bet by picking quiz answer A, they look like they are young. Keep reading, because later in the same paragraph, they compare the argon gas isotope ratios within the rock to date the rock. Problem is, the ages they got were between 500,000 years old and 2.4 million years. Well, that's uh, quite the spread to pick from. Age is different by a factor of almost five. However, they know the rocks are not contaminated because, after all, they spent copious amounts of time hand-picking young rocks using a binocular microscope. Therefore, the anomalous ages must have been caused by a loss of argon gas. So the answer to the quiz is A, they look like they are young, and B, they smell like they are young. However, some of the samples have lost some of their old smell, so they smell younger than they actually are. They thus conclude that the true age of the KBS tuff must be revised from 2.61 million years to 2.4 million years old. Because clearly all of those younger ages that were returned were an error because of a loss of argon. If you remain unimpressed by Fitch et al. and their argumentation, don't worry, you're in good company. Because even this 2.4 million year age is still way too unacceptable because skull 1470 was found below the KBS tuff. That means the skull is at least 2.4 million years old, still way too old for evolution dogma. But wait, there's more. If you take a look at the previous article in the same issue of Nature, oh, Herford, remember him? Back in 1974, he had previously published a paper using fission track dating on the 3.9 tuff. And he wasn't sure about things because either that 3.9 tuff had been completely annealed 1.8 million years ago, or it wasn't annealed at all. But because of Fitch and Miller's solid 2.6 million year date on the KBS tuff, the 3.9 tuff must have been annealed 1.8 million years ago. But that put us in a weird spot because somehow the tuff in the middle of the sandwich got heated to the point of annealing, but the other tufts didn't. Well, in that very same issue of Nature, Herford et al. revisited the fission track dating method, but this time checked out the fission tracks in tiny crystals called zircons taken straight from the KBS tuff. Using this method, they arrived at an age of 2.44 million years old, which is compatible with the original Fitch and Miller 2.61 million year age, and not compatible with the 1.82 million year age published from the group who won't be named. <coughs> Curtis et al. 
as will become very important, this fission track dating method relies heavily on the half-life of uranium-238, something deep time advocates and most scientists would contend is a time set in stone and never varying. If the half-life times of all the elements used in radio dating vary, then the radio dating clocks would be way off, right? Especially if you're talking about deep time of, you know, millions or billions of years. The longer the time, the greater the variation in the clock and the greater the discrepancy in the age. Oh, by the way, did we mention that three of the zircons returned ages of 303, 380, and 293 million years old? Do you guys remember when Fitch and Miller first published their potassium argon dates way back in 1970? They reported anomalous dates of 211 to 230 million years old. They rejected those dates because they were clearly too old. We come full circle with Herford and team now rejecting the dates of several zircon crystals in their samples. But fret not, Herford and team know those zircons are older contamination because A. They look old and give an old age. B. They smell old and give an old age. C. They taste old and give an old age. D. They feel old and give an old age. Or E. They sound old and give an old age. Herford and team tell us exactly how they came to that conclusion. These crystals all have very low fission track densities. From the perfect nature of these zircons, they must be regarded as juvenile crystals. Approximately 5% of the zircons are variable in form and much darker in color. Since these crystals all have high fission track densities, they appear to be old. So the correct answer to the quiz is A, they look old and give an old age. Oh, and the old ages are incompatible with any of the other dating methods. Except for perhaps Fish and Miller's original anomalous dates of 230 million or so years from 1970 that were clearly wrong because they were clearly too old. So they do not include those crystals nor their ages in their final data. So we are left with an age of 2.44 million years for the KBS Tuff, which is compatible with both the original Fitch and Miller date of 2.61 million years, but also compatible with Fitch and Team's revised date of 2.4 million years, given in the following pages of the very same journal. And oh, by the way, this 2.44 million year date was compatible with the date given by Brock and Isaac based on the paleomagnetic signatures. You remember that paper? Brock and Isaac based their dates on the original Fitch and Miller 2.61 million year age. And do remember that Curtis and team even had isochron ages in the mix there. So Herford, Fitch and everybody are now tossing out isochron ages that were published in the peer reviewed scientific literature. Are you not convinced? Look at this powerful evidence showing complete concordance between multiple independent dating methods that agree with incredible precision. But if you're not convinced, well, fret not, because a whole bunch of evolutionary researchers aren't convinced either and are about to hand a life lesson to the growing list of over a dozen researchers who have now published their dates in peer-reviewed journals. The lesson is this. If any date from any dating method, paleomagnetic, fission track dating, radiometric dating, isochrons, etc., disagrees with this evolution column and these predetermined dates, the dating methods are sacrificed at the altar of evolution. This evolutionary column trumps all science. End of discussion. And Skull 1470 is one of the best examples out there of this process. Why? Because the rocks were dated first, and then when Skull 1470 came along, it changed where all those rock layers wound up on the evolutionary column.
A column which I might remind you is fiction. It is dogma, not science. Once again, in the March 20th, 1980 issue of Nature, two back-to-back -back articles were published using fission track dating of zircon crystals from within the KBS tuff and new potassium argon dates on the KBS tuff, which, like, totally agree with each other that the KBS tuff is actually 1.87 to 1.89 million years old. As we've seen, Back-to-back -back papers in a peer-reviewed scientific journal using multiple independent dating methods that agreed with each other on the same age presents a very compelling argument that the new age presented is the correct age and refutes the previous back-to-back -back papers in the same peer-reviewed scientific journal that used multiple independent dating methods that agreed with each other on the original same age, which is now shown to be completely erroneous. In the following year, McDougall published a follow-up paper using argon-argon radio dating on the KBS Tuff to arrive at a solid age of 1.88 million years old. This age is acceptable to the evolution column and the time of the descent of man, placing the age of Skull 1470 at about 1.9 million years. This is now the accepted age of the skull. Obviously, this new benchmark date was not accepted because multiple independent dating methods agreed. We already had seen such concordance for a completely other age that stood as the benchmark for some 10 years. So why was this younger age accepted as fact. You remember those pig and elephant fossils that were found scattered throughout the layers above and below the KBS tuff? I'll let Lubinow explain it so eloquently. The pigs won. In the 10-year controversy over the dating of one of the most important human fossils ever discovered, the pigs one. The pigs won over the elephants. The pigs won over potassium argon dating. The pigs won over argon argon dating. The pigs won over fission track dating. They won over paleomagnetism. The pigs took it all. But in reality, it wasn't the pigs that won. It was evolution that won. In the dating game, evolution always wins. All of this was historically traceable in peer-reviewed scientific literature. I often get comments from angry anti-creationists parroting the false criticism that creationists don't publish in peer-reviewed literature and demanding that we creationists cite evolutionary peer-reviewed literature. Okay, I just spent two lectures doing nothing but citing the evolutionary peer-reviewed literature. Are you expecting me to be somehow impressed? This was a decades-long anti-science circus act to provide an excuse, not justification, an excuse to assign an age to Skull 1470 in order to make it compatible with the fictitious evolution column. Literally hundreds of dates from multiple dating methods that confirmed each other, published by evolutionary scientists in peer-reviewed scientific journals, were hurled in the trash as they gave good reasons why everybody should reject the dates given by the others. Question, how do we know who was right? What if they were all wrong? How would we know? <laughs> I leave you with a fantastic quote from John Wimborapi in his book, The Mythology of Modern Dating Methods, where he sums it all up. We have seen over and over again that dates are rejected primarily on an after-the-fact basis. They are all essentially trial balloons. And this is not only true of individual dates, but also groups of them. Thus, virtually any pattern of dates can be explained a posteriori. 
and contrary to the claims about discrepant dates being rare, they are in fact more than common. It has been shown that they are the rule, not the exception. If uniformitarians are free to reject dates that don't fit their ideas, then so are creationist scientists. And if it is correct that only a relatively small number of dates are supposedly highly reliable, this means the creationists end up rejecting only a relatively few more dates than the uniformitarians already do. With the aforementioned fact that so-called reliability criteria are they themselves subjective, this takes on further significance. As I hope you have seen in this case study, the most ardent evolutionists and deep time advocates will reject radio dating methods and ages of millions to billions of years on a whim. The evolution column dictates what acceptable, what ages are acceptable and which are not. Now you are welcome to believe all of this, but it is religious dogma, not science. In the next lecture, we'll take a look at the most common dating method that you've all heard of and uncover how it is actually the friend of young earth advocates. Coming up in the next Complete Creation. Because they collected samples from the Triassic, Jurassic, and Eocene deposits, this would represent evolutionary time of 37 to 245 million years, 208 million years total. The flattened Pleochroic halos and the radioactive decay that took place afterwards conclusively shows us that in fact, 208 million evolutionary years were actually all one event a few thousand years ago. Exactly in line with the biblical account of a global flood a few thousand years ago. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to Core Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support. <laughs>